On this Tuesday night, the Ukrainian president's impassioned plea to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Severe explosion. Justin, can you imagine hearing his powerful message? Every night is a horrible night. And his criticism of NATO. Key under siege and under curfew, the new deadly assaults and a new show of support in Ukraine. <laughs> Defiance and dissent, a Russian journalist resurfaces after protesting the invasion. It was really terrible. And Kremlin propaganda. And a major dust-up, why Spain suddenly looks like Mars. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, David Aiken. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Kyiv's mayor has placed Ukraine's capital city under a curfew after another fatal bombing in a residential neighborhood. Ukraine Emergency Services says civilians were killed after numerous buildings were struck by missile attacks. More on the situation on the ground in a minute, but first, Canada has imposed new sanctions on 15 Russian officials that are accused of helping Vladimir Putin invade Ukraine. And the Kremlin has fired back by banning Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and others from entering Russia. All of this comes on the same day that Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky delivered a speech directly to the Canadian Parliament. Abigail Beeman has more on his message and how the government is responding. Rare all-party unity supporting the Ukrainian president's address to Parliament in a House of Commons more packed than at any time since the pandemic began. Can you imagine famous CN Tower in Toronto? If, they, if it was hit by Russian bombs. In a 12-minute address, Volodymyr Zelensky tried to bring the heartbreaking situation facing his people even closer to Canadians, calling on the Prime Minister by name. Imagine that on, the, on 4 a.m., each of you, you start hearing bomb explosions, severe explosion. Justin, can you imagine hearing you, your children, hear all these severe explosions, bombing of airport, bombing of Ottawa airport? MPs, senators and about 200 guests in the public gallery heard Zelensky confirm the fighting has already killed 97 Ukrainian children. And while the Ukrainian president acknowledged Canada is leading international efforts to help, he was critical of allies who won't declare a no-fly zone over his country. Can you imagine when you, when you call your friends, your friendly nation, and you ask, please close the sky? Close the airspace. Please stop the bombing. How many more cruise missiles have to fall on our cities until you make this happen? And they, in return, they express their deep concerns. Close the skies, work with NATO, figure out how we can make it work. Ukrainian Canadians watching were moved by the speech and the gravity of the moment. It was really powerful. It was um, jaw-dropping. It was amazing to be a part of all of that. We'll probably only understand how historic this day actually is in years to come. His appeal to the Ukrainian-Canadian diaspora, of course, was very heartfelt. And we want him to know that we are fighting hand and fist to assist Ukraine. It is our moral duty. Party leaders responded to the prime minister spoke ahead of Zelensky. I've always thought of you as a champion for democracy. And now democracies around the world are lucky to have you as our champion. And where there aren't adequate tools, by God, let's invent them. And my parliamentary bureau colleague, Abigail Beeman, joins me now. Abigail, we were both there in the House of Commons, an extraordinary day in Parliament. What stood out to you? David, it was really that sense of all party unity, of everyone coming together in such a historic moment. You and I both haven't seen the House that full in, in more than two years with a packed public gallery as well. There was so much applause and standing ovations, and not just for President Zelensky, but for party leaders of all stripes as well. Uh, we heard from Elizabeth May in your piece. What did the other opposition leaders have to say after the speech? Well, what really stood out were comments from the interim Conservative leader, Candace Bergen, the only party, the Conservative Party, to be talking about a no-fly zone. We must do more together with our allies to secure Ukraine's airspace. We need 
to protect at a minimum the airspace over the humanitarian corridors. Candace Bergen isn't exactly calling for a full no-fly zone over Ukraine, but a partial one to protect Ukrainians who want to leave war-torn areas safely and to get humanitarian aid in. Meanwhile, the bloc leader called for more weapons for Ukraine, the NDP leader for more sanctions on Russia and more humanitarian aid, and the Prime Minister announced another 15 Russians would be sanctioned today as well. And of course, almost as soon as Zelensky had finished his speech, we saw a release from the Russian foreign ministry that Justin Trudeau and others are to be banned from Russia. What can you tell us about that? Well, Canada has consistently been announcing new sanctions against Russia, and now we see Russia firing back with this list of 313 Canadians who are banned from entering Russia. It's mostly MPs, so the Prime Minister, Defence Minister Anita Anand, uh, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie, and then there are close to two dozen other names on that list. Everyone from uh, the Chief of the Defence Staff to the Head of FinTrack, members of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, and half a dozen people involved with the planning of a memorial here in Ottawa for victims of communism. Russia isn't just targeting Canada here. There are also uh, new sanctions, a shorter list against Americans, including President Joe Biden. David? All right, Abigail Beeman here in Ottawa. Thank you. The United Kingdom issued hundreds of new sanctions against the Russian president's allies. The British After government says today, it is targeting people who are propping up Vladimir Putin and helping facilitate the invasion of Ukraine. It's estimated those individuals have a net worth of approximately $166 billion Canadian. New legislation was required to pass this round of sanctions. The Ukrainian capital is now under a 35-hour curfew after another day of Russian bombardments. At least four people were killed in Kyiv. The mayor says the city faces a, quote, difficult and dangerous moment as Russian troops edge closer. In the south, the hard-hit port city of Mariupol is surrounded, though some civilians managed to escape today. As Redmond Shannon reports, those left behind face a worsening situation. A deadly night of shelling in Kyiv that many in Ukraine's capital fear may become all too common. Right now, everyone is angry. I talk to the people. They don't want to leave. They really upset what, what Russian soldiers do it with civilians. Homes are destroyed, buildings in ruins, and a blanket curfew is now in effect until at least Thursday in anticipation of further attacks. We would like to ask you to help yourself by helping us. President Vladimir Zelensky continued his appeal to European leaders for more arms. Destruction in the second city of Kharkiv too, normally home to one and a half million people. This resident who describes himself as Russian says he doesn't need weapons. You want to fight Putin? Come find me, black belt. I could tear you apart with my bare hands, he says. In besieged Mariupol, more civilians escaped in some 2,000 cars Tuesday, but Ukraine says Russia is again blocking aid from entering. We're essentially being suffocated in this city right now with no aid. The EU says at least 2,400 civilians have been killed here so far. We know of families who are undoing oil heaters to take the water coolant out as a last resort, as something to drink. The regional governor says 400 patients and staff are effectively being held hostage by Russian troops in this now damaged hospital. <laughs> Further to the west, Russia claims it now controls all of Kherson region. Anger and sadness are only mounting. Ukrainians mourning some of the 1,300 soldiers the government says have been killed so far. That number will surely rise as the latest round of peace talks have again failed to produce any obvious progress. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. And the number of people fleeing Ukraine has been rising steadily since the invasion began nearly three weeks ago. The United Nations Refugee Agency says three million people have fled to neighboring countries since February the 24th. Poland has taken in the vast majority, more than 1.8 million people followed by Romania and Moldova. NATO will convene a special summit in Brussels next week to discuss Russia and Ukraine. 
World leaders, including U.S. President Joe Biden, will be there. The high-level talks come as pressure mounts for the coalition to do more to stop Russian aggression. Ukraine's president is pleading for a no-fly zone. And as Heather Urich's West reports, at least one NATO country is publicly supporting the idea, despite the risk of war with Russia. As misery compounds in Ukraine, NATO's secretary general called world leaders once again to Brussels. President Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine is causing death and destruction every day. An extraordinary summit will be held in Europe next week as pressure mounts for the coalition to do more to stop the bloodshed. On Monday, the Parliament of Estonia passed a resolution calling for the no-fly zone Ukraine so desperately seeks, making it the first NATO country to take a public stand. While Tuesday, the leaders of Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovenia traveled to Kyiv, putting themselves at risk in a show of solidarity as Russian forces continue their advance towards the city. I'm impressed by their bravery. I also would say that it's not going to be a game changer because Ultimately, these countries can't really provide anything like a no-fly zone. The majority of NATO's member countries remain opposed to a no-fly zone, knowing it will be seen by Russia as an escalation beyond Ukraine's borders. The no-fly zone, uh, which often people shorthand, essentially means us shooting down Russian planes and them potentially shooting back at us. But nearly three weeks into the bloody conflict, the Russian president has shown no signs of backing down. I think it is important for the West to deal very directly with, uh, in some way, with the nuclear blackmail, that if Putin gets away with nuclear blackmail in this case, he will try to use it in the future. NATO has also raised concerns that Russia may stage false flag attacks in Ukraine using chemical weapons. Whether that's a red line is something NATO leaders will have to address when they meet in Belgium next week. David? Heather Urich's West in Washington tonight. Thank you, Heather. Two more journalists have been killed in Ukraine after a vehicle they were traveling in came under fire outside Kyiv. Veteran war photographer and Fox News camera person Pierre Shushevsky and Ukrainian journalist Oleksandra Sasha Kushnova, who was assisting the Fox News crew, both died in the attack. Fox News correspondent Benjamin Hall was also injured, and he remains in hospital. A Russian journalist has been fined and released from custody after interrupting a live TV news broadcast to protest against the war in Ukraine. Marina Ovsianakova is an editor and producer at one of Russia's state-run TV networks, as Ross Lord reports, despite the consequences, her actions may be inspiring others. It took courage for Marina Ovsianakova to protest Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, storming the set of one of Russia's most popular news programs with a poster reading in Russian, Stop the war, don't believe the propaganda, they are lying to you here. The moment spread quickly around the world. The risk of going to prison, or worse, is very real in a country that just legislated even tighter restrictions on journalists and freedom of expression. There could be retaliation against your family. Uh, this is a regime, the Vladimir Putin regime, that has not hesitated to use the harshest possible measures against dissent. Family members and supporters feared the worst after Ovsiana Kova disappeared into police custody for nearly 24 hours, with the Kremlin calling her actions hooliganism. She says police interrogated her extensively for 14 hours, and she wasn't allowed a lawyer or to contact her family. She's been fined, not for the on-air protest, but for a separate video statement urging others to protest. Wearing a necklace with the colors of the Ukraine flag, her father's home country, she's not backing down. It was my own anti-war decision. Yeah, if I made this decision by myself because I uh, uh, don't like uh, Russia start this uh, invasion. What's happening in Ukraine is a crime, she says, and Russia is the aggressor. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has singled out Ovsiana Kova, who also has two children, for praise. Since she spoke out, a growing number of prominent journalists have reportedly left their positions at Russian state media, including Lilia Gildeyeva, a leading TV anchor who'd been praised by Putin. 
Gildieva has fled Russia. The bravery of these people is absolutely extraordinary because they don't know if it will have the effect that they hope for, but they act out of principle. He says they could be seen as heroes if the Russian invasion fails or forgotten if Putin succeeds. Ross Lord, Global News. It has been months since four members of a Muslim family were killed in London, Ontario. Coming up, what court documents now suggest about the alleged attacker? And Global National is broadcasting from the nation's capital tonight. We're back in a moment. There is new information tonight outlining the police investigation into the deaths of a Muslim family in London, Ontario in June of 2021. Four members of the Ufsal family died after being run over by the driver of a pickup truck. As Mike Drolet reports, new court documents reveal the alleged attacker may have been radicalized on the dark web. Nine months after four members of the Ufsal family were killed in London, Ontario while out for an evening walk, very little is still publicly known about their alleged attacker. Nathaniel Veltman had a small footprint on social media, with only a few photos existing online of the now 21-year-old. Newly released court documents show investigators have scoured Veltman's digital storage devices for internet browsing data, communications, documents, videos, and pictures, in a bid to learn more about the motivations of the alleged attacker and evidence of advanced planning. A sweeping publication ban still covers many details of the investigation. However, the new information does reveal police found documents that appear to be hate-related material and relevant to the listed offenses. Global News has previously reported that several sources familiar with the investigation have said that Veltman was influenced by the gunman who attacked a pair of mosques in New Zealand in 2019. And the documents show police searching for evidence of motive and planning through Veltman's possible activity on the dark web, which can be used to hide illegal activity. In an email to Global News, Veltman's lawyer Christopher Hicks wrote, Investigators may have searched for evidence that Mr. Veltman had shown an interest in the dark web, as many in the Republican Party apparently have, but there is no evidence of actual successful contact by Mr. Veltman. Indeed, security experts say it's extremely hard to track browsing history through what are known as Tor browsers. If it happens that someone has been involved in crimes and um, there's all kinds of other evidence around that, then the presence of Tor may indicate something related to how they're trying to avoid scrutiny. But, but just having the Tor browser um, shouldn't be in of itself a, uh, a scarlet letter. Veltman faces four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder of the Afzal's nine-year-old boy who survived the attack. Veltman also has been charged with murder terrorist activity. He has yet to enter a plea and his next court date is in April. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. And still ahead, why parts of Spain are seeing orange. Watching Global National. This is not a filter. You are looking at the sky in southeastern Spain turned orange by dust. It's the impact of strong wind from a storm that scooped up sand from the Sahara Desert. The sandstorm could reach as far north as the Netherlands and northwestern Germany. Canada's Governor General was in London today, meeting with Queen Elizabeth and members of the royal family. Mary Simon and her husband attended tea with the Queen at Windsor Castle. It is their second official meeting. The pair also met with the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall at Clarence House. Imagine that someone is Next, Zelensky's passionate plea to Canada in a historic speech to Parliament. Global National returns from Ottawa right after this break. Back to our top story now. Nearly three weeks into Russia's invasion, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky delivered a powerful speech to the House of Commons. Here is more of his call to action, his vow to prevail, and the words of support for Ukraine from this country's parliamentarians. Volodymyr, in the years I've known you, 
I've always thought of you as a champion for democracy. And now, democracies around the world are lucky to have you as our champion. Can you imagine that every day you receive memorandums about the number of casualties, including among women and children? Can you imagine famous CN Tower in Toronto? If, they, if it was hit by Russian bombs. Of course, I don't wish this on anyone, but this is our reality. This war of naked aggression has revealed Vladimir Putin for what he really is, a warmonger and a violent predator with no regard for human life and suffering. Ukrainians are saying we will not back down, we will not give up, and we are so incredibly inspired by them for their fight for democracy, for their fight for freedom. We want to live, and we want to be victorious. We want to prevail for the sake of life. And I am confident that together we will overcome and we will be victorious. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you to Canada. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm David Aiken. We leave you tonight with images from Immersive Shevchenko, Soul of Ukraine. This is an exhibit happening today only in Toronto, brings to life the work of Ukraine's most renowned artist and poet, Taras Shevchenko. 100% of the ticket sales will be donated to relief efforts for Ukraine. Once again, thank you so much for watching. Have a good night.